Inshallah, we'll continue on where we um, left off. We were talking about the, the Big Bang Theory, that everything in the universe began from a point of singularity, and from that point of singularity, um, matter was uh, blasted into the universe, upon which it began to mix with each other, and to the point to where we see what we see now. There became a problem with this theory when... Um, telescopes were placed out into space that could um, see across the expanses of the universe and take temperature readings and see um, the microwave background radiation of the universe, etc. What they came to realize was that the universe was a little bit more perfect than they, they, they had first suspected because from this blast of matter you would expect to see chaos. I mean, this is just reality. You don't cause an explosion and create order out of it. This is just not what happens. You don't dump every uh, piece of a building into a big bucket, blow it up, and then a building comes out. I don't care if you did that and replicated that a billion gazillion times. It would never, ever, ever happen. So how is it that this explosion caused such order? Because the temperature gradient in the universe from one expanse to the other is almost exactly the same. With a very, very, very minute to a point zero zero something of a of a uh, degree centigrade, same. Also, the microwave radiation, which is the background of the universe, is completely patterned even from one side of the universe to the other. So, how did this happen? So, the new theory. You see, this is the thing about theories when they're not based on truth from the one who designed. You see, if you want to know about a painting. You would have to ask the painter. Like now, when we look at people go to the, uh, the, the, the museum, what is it, uh, in Paris? What is that thing called? The Louvre. The Louvre, however you want to say it in proper French. And they look at paintings like the Mona Lisa, and they ponder, what is she thinking? What is the purpose? What was the meaning behind this painting? Without the painter here anymore, it's just speculation. And there are many theories about uh, what it is that it was intended by this painting. Some of them might be true, all of them might be wrong. We'll never know. This is the thing about these type of theories. If you want to know about the design or if you want to know about the existence of something, it must come from the person who designed it. So this new theory is the water drop theory. In that the, because if you ever had taken, seen a drop of water, once it hits the plane surface, it creates a, an initial big expulsion of water that then comes back in on itself and then slowly ripples out. This is the new theory on the existence of the universe, that that first expulsion of matter, that first big bang was so forceful that it created a vacuum back in on itself, which then mixed every molecule and matter together and then evenly started to spread it out across the universe. They say it's very, it's very, very logical now, isn't it? And the way they tested this was by splattering paint. And that no matter how many times you splattered that paint, you could never get an even, even coating on anything. So this is the new, the new theory. The Quran very simply sums up the reason why the earth exists and the universe exists. Because the problem with some of these theories and this is where I'm going to just divulge on a sidetrack for just a moment, is that the laws of physics, when you start playing with theories, start contradicting each other. Because there are a few laws, tangible laws, that have been ob observed, and they're part of the observable universe as we know it, that are pretty found and secure. We all know that as Muslims, that the laws of physics can be changed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created them, He can alter them. But as we see them, the observable laws are very, some of them are quite clear. And they were put forward in the theories of relativity and, and other, other papers that were put out in, in, in um, the past couple of centuries. One of them is called the law of inertia. 
the law of inertia. And this one is, is a big one for me. This one, this one kind of sort of proves the existence of a creator. Does anybody know what the law of inertia is? We're at the American University of Kuwait. We have to have some, some knowledge of physics in the room. The law of inertia, anybody? Huh? What was that? You gotta be sure about yourself. That's pretty much it. Let's, let's, let's define it. An object that is in motion will perpetually stay in motion. An object that is moving will perpetually continue to move unless it is met by an opposable force which stops its motion. Correct? That's what we know as friction. Friction. Like if you go and you try to take a, um, a hockey puck outside. You guys know what a hockey puck is, right? Outside on the parking lot and you try to slide it across the parking lot, how far is it going to go? It's not going to go very far because there's a lot of friction between the rubber and the pavement. But now you take that same hockey puck to an ice rink that is completely smooth and has very little friction and you slide it, how far will it go? Go to the other side if you push it hard enough. So this is the law of inertia at work, that an object in motion will perpetually remain in motion unless it is stopped. This is the reason why planets orbit and things like that because there is nothing stopping them. There is no opposable force keeping them from doing so. On the flip side of that, an object at rest that's not moving will never move. An object that is not moving will never move unless it is met by an opposable force that forces it and causes it to move, propulsion. So, if we say that the universe began at a point of singularity, upon which all matter came out into the universe, whether by the Big Bang Theory or the Water Drop Theory or whatever theory you want to come forward with, my question would be, what propelled it? What moved it? If something moved, what moved it? How did it move? Because to say it moved on its own violates the very laws of the observable known universe that we see today. You see, conundrums begin to be created when you try to play with the design of the Creator. When you try to toy with it, then you come up with these types of contradictions that don't really work. The Qur'an answers this very clearly, that if, if everything in this universe began as a point of singularity, if matter propelled into the universe and then began to combine with other elements that then created everything that we see today or formed everything we see today, then we know exactly how it happened. Kun fayakun. The Creator said for it to move and it moved. The Creator said for it to exist, it existed. The reason why things exist the way they exist today is because every atom, every molecule, every nucleus knew exactly where it was supposed to be, how it was supposed to be, and when it was supposed to be there to form what we see today. And all of that, all of that we can observe in this earth and around it was created in such a fashion to sustain human life. Is that by coincidence? Really? You mean to tell me that the sun is exactly where it needs to be? By coincidence. If it were any closer, no human beings. If it were any farther, no human beings. That thing called the moon out there, however it got there, there are many theories about how the moon got there. Without that thing being there, no us. Were it to move a little bit farther away or come a little bit closer, no us. The atmosphere and how it is layered in such a matter that the weight of these layers keeps breathable air at a level where we can have it. Were that air to go up a thousand feet, we'd be done. A hundred feet, the breathable air, we'd all have to live in this Burush Khalifa in order to be able to, to, to exist. By coincidence, the fact that this atmosphere is in such a design that it protects us, that sun is just close enough, but without those layers, it's too close. Because the UV radiation would fry all of us to a crisp the moment we stand out there. And I'm not talking about late July standing out in the streets in Kuwait. I'm talking about you're done type of heat. And that atmosphere keeps moisture in, in such a way that moisture continually recirculates itself, not losing it throughout the evaporation and things of that nature. All of that by chance just happened to be. 
and then the molecules needed to make human beings just happen to end up on this one planet in this one solar system in order for all of that to come about. Now who sounds more silly? The person who says that the Burj Khalifa was created in a sandstorm or the person who says human beings exist due to these random coincidences that began uh, a million years ago through a bang that propelled from who knows what. You see how silly this starts to sound when you break it down to its minute and most elementary level. If I were to tell my son that things exist just by chance a billion years ago, some stuff fell together and made us, he would look at me very silly. This doesn't even, doesn't even, I've tried this with my children and they're very perplexed and curious about it. What? This doesn't make any sense. But if I were to tell them that there is a creator who created everything, he has the power to cause things to exist that never existed before. And we do know for a fact that things existed that never existed before. And he created it because he is powerful enough to do so. They completely understand that. There's no problem with them grasping that even at a very young age. So Islam is very simple in this. And there's no real long scientific process for this. We know that a creator exists because creation exists. The existence in the Quran says it very uh, um, clearly many times over. Have you not pondered the creation? Have you not looked in the sky at night? Have you not looked at the world around you? Have you not looked at your own self? Have you not even internalized you to know that I exist? Look at the human heart. A muscle that we take for granted. With, without it, we don't, don't, don't make it. And it starts beating very early on in the conception of the human being. Very early on in the, in the process of an embryo in the womb of its mother, the moment that heart is formed, it begins to beat. And it continually beats until the day you die. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to control it. You can't control it. You can temper it in some ways. But imagine for a moment if you had to cognitively cause your heart to beat every single second of every single day. Guess what your life would be? Staying alive. It would be your entire life. You, you forget for a moment, this is it, you're dead, heart attack, done. This thing continually beats nonstop. Think about the human eye. Look at the great lenses that the minds of the world have been able to create today. Telescopes that can see across the universe. Powerful lenses. Not one of them has even come close to replicating the lens of the human eye. Not one. Not even close. Has been able to come close to even the focus ability of the human eye. The ability to process light in such a quick matter of time to be able to see the world that is around you. Not been able to be replicated. Look at the human liver. Something that we also become very uh, unaware of our liver. And without it, you're a dead man. You're a dead woman. Because this liver all day long, guess what it's doing? It's chemically analyzing your blood. All day long, your liver is chemically analyzing every drop of blood in your body and detoxifying it and keeping it at a level which will remain, keep you remaining alive. The moment that liver begins to not work how it's supposed to do, the body begins to poison its own self. We don't even have to think about it. It just does it. The brain, look at the brain, a part of the human anatomy that we really don't even really know much about yet. We say that we only use maybe 10%, a little bit more or less of it. What is the rest for? We, we don't know because we have very li limited abilities to understand these certain things. But look at the brain. A computer has not been able to be created that can replicate the process that goes on with, between the neurons of the human brain and the way it transmits information, the way it controls the serotonin levels and things of that nature. It's, it's unimaginable to study the human anatomy and then to think that there is not some design going on here. The amazing capacity of the human body to do things that, that, that are done without thought. That advanced computers take, you know, mega processes. We're getting better at making them smaller. They till, still take very complicated processes and they don't always work. The human body just does what it's supposed to do. It does what it's supposed to do in most cases, unless you get sick. Islam is very simple. That this exists exactly the way it's supposed to because the Creator designed it to be so. The Creator designed it to be so. Now, if we're to say that the Creator designed all of this for a reason, why? What's the reason? You see? This is the, the, the why of the why. 
You see, if we say, okay, I know and I understand that we exist because the Creator created us to exist. Okay, now why did He create us to exist? Why? What's the purpose? You see, this is what a lot of Muslims don't even understand. Why? What's our purpose? A lot of Muslims can quote that one off because it's right in the Quran. Okay? Why? Why did Allah create us to worship Him? Yes, absolutely. And He wants to give us a chance. There is a reason behind this too. And it is told to us in the Quran. You see, the beautiful thing about the Quran, brothers and sisters, and for our guests, is this Quran is not a, merely a book. It's not just a book. It's the speech of the designer of the universe. It is the speech of the creator of all things. And in the Quran it says, in this book we left out nothing. We left out nothing. Therefore, if you want to know the origin of species, why do we exist? How did we exist? The power of creation. Even the process of creation is contained in the Quran. That everything was created from smoke and things of this nature. The human beings are created from water. All of these things that scientists are just now coming around with their big mega brains to figure out. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and, and, the, and, and the illiterate Arabs of, of, of the 7th century and 8th century knew this already. You haven't figured out anything. <laughs> You're just behind. You're late. The Quran very early on. You see, the Quran was revealed in a stage of 23 years. And it was not compiled in its order of revelation, but it was compiled in an order for reason. Every single verse of the Quran is exactly where the designer of all things wanted it to be for a reason. And this is part of the studies of the Quran, is to study the way in which it is now combined and to try to uh, obtain the benefit from the reason why. If you open the Quran very early on in the first couple of pages, in Surah Al-Baqarah, you come to this why. And this is for our guest and for the Muslims in the room. So you can maybe a little bit understand who you are when you walk out of this room today, inshaAllah. The Creator, before we existed, He had a conversation with the angels. He had a conversation. And it was about us. You see, we were, we were being discussed. And the Creator said to the angels, إِنِّي جَعِلُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Indeed, I'm going to place on earth, on it, a Khalifa, meaning succeeding generations. Also, they understood from this word Khalifa that this is something special, something different. Not like anything else that Allah has created. This, this, this word has some deep, intense meaning behind it. So the angels had a question, and it was not a challenge question. It was not a question to challenge the, the statement of the Creator, but they wanted some of the wisdom. They wanted to understand why. Because they understood what was meant by this word Khalifa. That you're going to create something that's going to have succeeding generations and they're going to be given a, a, a free will to choose and do what they want to do and etc. So he asked, they asked, and before us and for our guest, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to delve too far into this. We believe there was another creation that had, or there is another creation that has a free will to choose called the Jinn. They don't really mingle with most of us, so we don't really, we don't mess with them, they don't mess with us too much. Um, but they also had a free will to choose, and they, they kind of screwed it up a bit. You know, they made a mess of things. So, the angels asked our Lord, Are you going to place on it one who is going to cause mischief and shed blood? While we celebrate your praises day and night. You see, the angels were trying to understand something. That our Lord, if you want to be worshipped, and that's the reason why you're creating this Khalifa. We do that and we can't disobey that. And you can create more of us to do that. So why create this Khalifa who's going to cause mischief and shed blood on that place you're going to put them on? Now did the angels understand us or did they understand us not? Were they right about us? They were right about us. Yeah, they were really right about us. They were more right than they probably understood. How long was it before the bloodshed began? The very sons of this Khalifa would start it. So they were right. They were quickly right. So they knew and Allah understood exactly what we were going to do. So his response to them was not an explanation. He didn't give wisdom. He didn't give some deep insights. What did he say? 
inni alamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what you don't know. I know something about this khalifa that you don't know. I know something that you don't know. Then Allah Jalla wa ala created Adam from the clay of the earth with his own two hands, unlike the hands of the creation, the creation, but his two hands. And from the very beginning, everyone understood there's something special about this one. And there was one from amongst the jinn, whose name was Iblis. We now call him Shaitan, Satan, whatever you want to call him. He's called Beelzebub and all other kinds of names in the Bible. He automatically had an enmity to this thing. Because it's being given special treatment. He's looking at it. It's made of dirt. Before it was even given life, Adam was just there as a, as a figure. And he's saying to himself, what, what is this thing? It's made of dirt. I'm made of fire. There's nothing special about this. He even toyed with it, kicked it about. Nothing, nothing special about this thing. Then Allah gave life to this Adam. He lived. And he taught him the name of everything. Everything. And he asked the angels to name the same things. Do you know the names of these things? They said, our Lord, you know we don't have any knowledge except that which you have given us. So no. And he commanded Adam, tell him the names of all of these things. And Adam named them all. They realized, the angels at that moment realized there's something different about this one. Allah has given some, some special treatment to this creation right here. And so he asked all things to bow down. Not in worship, but in symbolization that this Khalifa that I created and his generation are something special. I've given them certain attention. And they all did except Iblis, who then became arrogant, jealous, arrogance. Uh, one of the seeds of e all evil in this world. Arrogancy and jealousy. He said, I will not bow down to that which you created from dirt because I and myself am created in fire and far better than that. And then Allah cursed him to be banished and he created the hellfire to place Satan in it forever. And Iblis had only one request, one request. He said, my Lord, just give me respite. Give me a leave of stay, a suspended sentence until the day of judgment. And why? Because he said, I will prove to you that they will be ungrateful. I will prove to you that they did not deserve what you gave them. I will mislead them. I will come to their fronts, from their backs, from both sides, and I will take them away from you. And Allah gave him the respite and said, go ahead, do as you please and you will get many of them. He said, but my chosen ones, the ones I choose, you won't be able to harm them. Then Allah created from Adam, from his rib bone, his wife Eve. And there's a lot of wisdom behind that rib bone. A lot of wisdom behind a rib bone. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, a rib is bent. If you try to straighten it forcefully, you're going to break it. He created his wife Eve and placed them both in the beautiful garden where they could live however they wanted to live. There were no rules except one. Allah told them all that you see within this garden is yours. Enjoy it. Live happily. But, don't eat the tree, the apples that are the tree. but there's one tree. I don't want you to touch it. One rule. Look at our lives now. SubhanAllah. How many rules do we have? You know, they had one rule. Don't eat from that tree. Don't eat from that tree. And then Iblis came to them, Satan came to them and tricked them into thinking that they were actually being withheld from something that was good for them. And they both ate from the tree. You see, the Qur'an doesn't lay blame. The Bible lays blame. It was Eve. She, she made him do it. The Qur'an says, no, no, no. They both ate from this tree and disobeyed the one rule. They disobeyed the one rule. Now I want to ask you guys a question. You don't have to tell me when, how, what kind, how bad. How many of you in this room have ever made a mistake? You've committed a sin. Are you going to commit a sin again probably? Yeah, you're going to do it again. If you live past tonight, you'll probably do it again. And again, and again, and again, and again. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kulli bani Adam khatta. Every son of Adam sins. Every one of them is going to sin. Doesn't make any sense. We were created to worship. But the Prophet is telling us we're going to disobey that. We're going to break the rules. It's guaranteed. So I'm not going to ask you whether or not you're going to sin in your life again. I know you. It's guaranteed. Sin and life mistakes are guaranteed. If you live and breathe and, 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 and walk about and do anything, you're going to make a mistake. So they made a mistake. They did the one thing they weren't supposed to do. And Allah came and told them, you cannot be here anymore. 
this garden that I created, this beautiful, magnificent place, is for perfection. You can't be here anymore. You have to go down to the earth now. You're going to live. You're going to get old. You're going to get sick. You're going to have to work for your food. And you're going to die. But he then promised him, but I will send to your people messengers who will then guide them to the right way of life. Promising him that he would always take care of this Khalifa. But there is a conversation that is recorded in the Tafsir of Ibn Kathir. A lot of people don't know about Ibn Kathir. Not only was he a... Uh, uh, a, a person who could give amazing tafsir of the Qur'an, but he was also a man of the hadith. He knew the hadith and he was well, well versed in the sciences of the hadith. He quotes a story of, that took place, a conversation, excuse me, that took place between Adam and his Lord as he was being exited from the garden. And this conversation gives us the understanding of the why of the why. Gives us the understanding of the why of the why. He asks, my Lord, did you not create me with your own two hands? Did you not create me? And Allah said, yes, I did. And he said, my Lord, did you not breathe into me the breath of life and cause me to live? He said, yes, I did. He said, when I sneezed, which is the first thing that Adam alayhi salam did, did you not say, ya Allah, did you not say, may Allah have mercy on you? He said, yes, I did. You see, now here comes the wisdom of Adam alayhi salam for all of us, the origin of species. He said, my Lord, when you placed me in that garden and told me not to eat from that tree, didn't you already know I was going to eat from that tree? You see, Adam understood that Allah knows. Before even creating anything, Allah knew Adam was going to eat from that tree. Before creating Adam, he knew he was going to eat from that tree and Eve. Before placing them in the garden, he knew they, he knew they were going to eat. When he created the tree and placed it in the garden, he knew they were going to eat from it. When he was telling them not to eat from it, he knew they were going to eat from it. So Adam is asking him, didn't you already know I was going to eat from this tree? And Allah said, yes, I knew you were going to eat from that tree. He said, then can you not forgive me for that and put me back in that garden one day? You see, this is the wisdom of Adam salam that is passed on to us to understand ourselves. And Allah said, yes, I can. And he taught him how. You see, this is the why of the why. Because, كُلِّ bani Adam khatta. We all sin, but why? Why? And what do we do about it? Because we're going to do it again and again and again and again. He taught him. Some words, that when you make a mistake, say this, mean it from the bottom of your heart, and I can put you back in that garden one day. What was he taught? Anybody know? My Lord, I have committed dhulam. What does dhulam mean? Oppression, harm, wrong. To whom? To myself. You see, there's a lot of wisdom in this dua as well. My Lord, I have wronged and done oppression and harmed my own soul. Because we as Muslims understand that no matter how much you disobey the Creator, no matter how much you defy Him, no matter how much you're obstinate against Him, even if you try to reject that He exists, you do no harm to Him in the least, nor do you decrease from His power and dominion whatsoever. You do no harm except to yourself. So we say, Our Lord, I have wronged my own soul. If you do not have mercy on me and forgive me for it, I will surely be a loser. You see, this is the purpose of the why of the why. If we get to the point we understand, we know that we exist because our Lord created us to exist. We know He created us to worship Him. We're not always going to do that. So now we know that sinning is a part of life. And we repent. But now why? Here goes the why of the why of the why. Why? You see, there was a reason why... Allah told the angels, I know what you don't know about this Khalifa. There's a reason why Allah gave such honor and dignity to this Khalifa. There's a reason why. You see, Allah can be known as Al Khaliq, the creator by that which He's created. Allah can be known as Al Qadir the powerful and competent one by the fact that he controls the affairs of the heavens and earth and the universe and all its expanse with no effort. With no effort. No effort. It's all controlled. He can be known as many things by that which we see around us. But there are some extremely powerful attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah Jalla wa Ala has shown to all of creation in this Khalifa. The fact that these creation, I'm going to give them the choice to do what they want to do. 
and they accepted it. They're going to mess it up, all of them. All, every single last one of them are going to mess it up. And one mistake. Did you know that one mistake gives Allah the right to put you in Jahannam? Did you understand that? Do you grasp that concept? That one sin, one single sin that you do, Allah has every single right to put you in Jahannam forever for it and you could not complain. You knew better. You did it yourself, knowingly. Allah could put you in there. I'm not talking about shirk. I'm just talking about sin in general. Because you weren't created for that. Allah commanded you to worship Him alone. For you to break one rule, Allah has every right to throw you in Jahannam for it. Every right. And what would you say? How would you complain? You did it. You did it yourself. So Allah has the right to put every single one of us there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed with Himself that He would show mercy. That He would be patient with this Khalifa and his progeny. He would be forbearing with them. He would be kind towards them. Give them food and drink even when they were rebelling against him. Give them air to breathe even when they denied him. And then there would be some amongst them who would turn to him, understanding the why of the why. And say to their Lord, my Lord, I have wronged my own soul. If you do not forgive me and mercy, have mercy on me, I will surely be a loser. And he would be forgiving. He would be forgiving. He would let it go. You see, true power does not come in your ability to do harm to someone. That's not power. There's no power in that. My business, my profession is I'm a martial arts instructor. I've been doing martial arts since I was 14 years old. I run two martial arts businesses. I have no doubt in my mind I could probably walk out onto this campus right now and hurt a few people. I have the capabilities to do so. Does that make me powerful? No, it doesn't make me powerful at all. Power is not punishing when you have the abilities, capabilities, and right to do so. That's not power. True power comes in when you have every right to punish, every right to do harm, every right to maim. And yet you show leniency and mercy. That's true power. And the most perfect of that is found in the creator of all things. In the fact that we as human beings sin every day. Every day we do what we're not supposed to do. Or we don't do enough of what we should do. And yet the creator, on the last third of every night. You see, when I began to under... <clears throat> it's a bit hard for me to talk about this subject. Because... It's the true why of the why. Even though we do all of this, the billions of us on earth, yet every single night, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the creator of all things descends into the lowest heaven in a matter that fits his majesty and honor, not like his creation coming and going. But he descends closest to the creation that he comes. And he only has one question. Who is it there, out there, tonight that is willing to ask me to forgive them because here I am ready to forgive them you see that's why Allah told the angels I know what you don't know this this Khalifa is going to be something special it's going to be something special it's going to bring out the most powerful of my attributes known to all things they, I am powerful, I am all of these things, but yet, above all of that, I am merciful. I am merciful, and I am forgiving, and I am forbearing. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Adam Every son of Adam sins. But the best of those who sin are those who repent. Those who repent. There are a couple of stories I'm going to give to you, and then we'll break for Q&A that how merciful the Creator is willing to be. One very famous one is that there was a woman, and I'm not going to talk about her profession because we have children in the room, but she was not the best woman, would be considered to be one of the worst women in today's society. Horrible, 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 horrible woman. And she was walking by a well one day. She had a lot of sin. She was walking by a well one day and she saw 
a dog licking the mud because it was thirsty. Saw a dog licking the mud because it was thirsty. So she climbed down in the well with, with her shoe, filled it up with water and gave that dog to drink. And because of that simple act of careless humanity, Allah forgave her for all that horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. You see the power of forgiveness, the power of mercy is found in Islam like no other religion. This is the message that the world needs to be hearing. We need to stop defending ourselves about terrorism. Muslims are not terrorists, never have been, never will be. We need to start preaching to the world the powerful message of forgiveness and mercy that is found in Islam from its very core, from its very beginning. The Quran begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the first few sentences, this is reiterated four times. Four times. There is another story that a man upon his deathbed knew he had so much sin that he told his children, burn my ashes and spread half of them in the, on the land and half of them in the sea because I never want Allah to catch me again. And his children did so, even though they didn't want to. They did it anyway, and on the Day of Judgment, Allah brought him all back together, created him in the beginning, could have created him again from nothing, and asked him, my, my servant, why did you do that? And he responds, you know very well, my Lord, why I did it, because I was fearful of your wrath. And because of that astute fear of the punishment of Allah, he forgave him and entered him into paradise for it. There will be another man who will be being dragged towards hell on the Day of Judgment. He's already been punished, I mean already been condemned. You sinned, you did so many sins, you're going to hell. And the angels are dragging him away to throw him into the fire. And as he approaches the brink of the fire, hell recedes back, pulls back from him. And Allah asks the hell, what is the matter with you? Which all of this is known to Allah, but the benefit is for us being passed down to us. Allah asks the hell, what is the matter with you? And hell says, my Lord, He is seeking refuge with you from me. That even though you've condemned Him, He could be angry, could be spiteful, even though you've condemned Him, and He's being dragged, He's still seeking refuge with you from me. So Allah tells the angels dragging Him, let my servant go and enters him into paradise. There's another man that is condemned and he's being dragged away. He says to Allah, my Lord, I did not expect this outcome from you. Shocking. <laughs> you did all the sin. What did you expect? What, what, what did you expect? He said, my Lord, I expected that you were so merciful that you could even show someone like me mercy. So Allah said, release my slave and let him go. What about the man who killed 99 people? He killed 99 people. He went to a worshiper, someone who did not have a lot of knowledge about who Allah really was. You see, this is, knowledge is very powerful. A knowledgeable person is more powerful than a thousand worshippers. He went to this worshipper and he said, I've killed 99 people, do you think Allah can forgive me? He said, no. He said, no. So guess what the man did? Killed. killed them too. If I can't be forgiven, make it an even hundred. Make it an even hundred. So time went on and he still had something. You see, this is the innate nature of someone who believes in Allah. Looking for that open door. Even if it's a small crack. So he said, I'm now, forget about this worshipping guy. I want to know the most knowledgeable person in this town. He went to the most knowledgeable person in that town. And he said, I've killed a hundred people now. Sword in his hand. He's ready to kill this guy too. No. Can Allah forgive me? What was his response? Yes. Who is it that Allah cannot forgive? Who told you that Allah cannot forgive sins? Allah forgives all sins, except for outright shirk. He said, but of course, Allah can forgive you of your sins. He said, but you need to leave this place. You need to leave this place. There's too much of your bad life and reputation and things are going to pull you back into that lifestyle here. Go to this town. There are some good people that will help you out. I'm sure you've heard this story, but I want you to understand the power behind this story. The power behind this story is, <laughs> it's, it's immeasurable. So the man was on his way and he died. And so the angel of mercy and the angel of wrath came to him. And they were arguing over who should take him. The angel of mercy is saying, no, 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 he was on his way to repent. I take him. The angel of wrath said he never made it. He didn't make it. So I take him. 
then Allah commanded that the earth to be measured. From the distance from where he is to the town he came from, then measure the distance of where he is to the town he is going, whichever one he is closer to, if he is closer to the town where he was going, the angel of mercy will take him. If he is closer to the town from whence he was coming, the angel of wrath will take him. Guess where he physically was closer to? He was physically closer to the town he came from. He should have been taken by the angel of wrath. But Allah, the creator of all things for this man, and to show us the power of his mercy, changed the physics and dimensions of the earth, caused the earth to shrink in order to make him closer. He could have just made him die closer. No, Allah wanted to show us, you and I, how powerful mercy truly is that he caused the entire earth's dimensions to change in order for this man to be found closer to the town on which he was going and the angel of mercy took him and he was forgiven. I mean, I don't know how much more of the why of the why I can get across to you tonight. You see, if you were designed to be perfect, you would not have been given a choice. You would not have been given a choice. You cannot be perfect, except through the covering of Allah's mercy. You see, that, that, that's what makes perfection. Two minutes and I'll be finished. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, and this is narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an in the, in the collection of Imam Muslim rahimahullah. He said, the Prophet ﷺ told us, let none of you think that by doing good deeds you will go to paradise. What? You mean to tell me all these good deeds I did are not going to take me to paradise? Yes, you're right, young man. None of these good deeds are going to take me to paradise. None of them. But I want you just to think about something. If you were to take all good deeds that were done by any human being, all of them together from the time of Adam to the last one, on the day of judgment, you were to go give them to one person, one person, all those deeds. And you were to tell that one person, go use these deeds to repay Allah for your heart. Would you have enough? No. Go repay Allah for your vision, for your brain, for the air you breathe, for the water you drank, for the food you ate, for the house you lived in. What, what, who, what, in, what amount of deeds are you going to need? Priceless. These things are priceless. Priceless. You would never have enough. There's a reason why, as Muslims, we refer to ourselves as Abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as slaves. Because a slave is someone who, number one, is forever in debt. A debt they cannot get out of. And this is the Muslim. The more you live, the more debt you go into. Every day you wake up, you're in debt again. You're breathing, you're in debt again. You're eating, you're in debt again. You're drinking, you're in debt again. Your heart's beating, you're going farther in the hole. So you will be perpetually indebted to Allah. And a slave cannot have anything except that which his master has provided for him. This is us. This is who we are. Slaves to our creator. Only having that which he has given us and forever in debt to him because of it. And we can't get out of it. So you wouldn't be able to pay even what you've been given in this life. So you want streets paved with gold? You want trees made of gold with leaves of softer than silk and, and fruit that is sweeter than honey and softer than butter? You want palaces which rivers run between? All of that just for those good deeds you did? What about all those sins? So they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, not even you can go to paradise because of your good deeds. He said, not even me unless Allah forgives me and has mercy on me. You see, it's through the mercy of Allah that we enter into paradise. That is Thammanul Jannah. That's the price of paradise. That's the price we're after. Good deeds, you'll never have enough. So give up trying to think about that. What you are trying to earn is that Allah forgives the mistakes and enters you into paradise. Very last thing. The why of the why of the why. There's a day that will be the most beautiful day in the history of humanity. Ever. Ever. Some will witness it. Many, unfortunately, will not. But those who understand the why of the why, inshallah, will all be there. After all of the people who were entered into paradise, enter into paradise. Yes? And we are looking at our beautiful homes and we're enjoying what we've seen. And this is narrated through many a hadith, but were compiled in a very storied manner by Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala and his madaraj salikin He said, a caller will call out throughout all of Jannah. Ya Ahlu Jannah. 
O people of paradise, Allah has asked you to come to this certain place. So we'll all be gathered there in this field. And in this field, people will be arranged in rank. There will be people who will be sitting on, on thrones on high. People who will be sitting on raised couches. Some of us just on silken carpets and others on the ground. And as we're all sitting there wondering what's, what's going on, the throne of Allah, which is the roof of paradise. <clears throat> it's hard to really even grasp that, that the throne of Allah is the roof of paradise. But the throne of Allah will be brought near to that place. And Allah will proceed forth and He will call out, Ya Ahlu Jannah, Salaamu Alaikum. O people of paradise, peace be upon you. And we will all say, Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. O oh Allah, you are peace, and from you comes peace. And then Allah will say to us, This is the day of increase that I promised you. This is the day of increase, as promised in the Quran, the day of increase. Ask me today anything you wish, and it shall be granted to you. I mean, realistically, what else do we want? You've given us paradise, we're in Jannah, we, we have whatever, we, I mean, we, we think about food, it's brought, we think about anything, it's, it's there. What do we want? What do we all want? We will say, our Lord, let us see you. We worshipped you for so long on that earth, and we never saw you. Today we want to see you. And Allah will lift his veil that prevents him from being seen by the creation. And a light will shine throughout paradise that will be so bright and so intense that if Allah had not willed, it would burn all of creation to non-existence. And we will gaze upon the face of our Lord. As the Quran says, on that day their faces will be bright, gazing upon their Lord. And He will bring each and every single one of us up. Every one of us. You have to understand time doesn't exist anymore. There's no concept of this. We're just, <laughs> just enjoying. But every one of us will be brought up and reminded of our sins. Allah will say, do you remember when you disobeyed me here? Do you remember when you did that sin, and that sin, and that sin? So many sins will be recounted to us until we lose hope that we're going to be thrown out of paradise. And we say, my Lord, can you not have mercy on me and forgive me for those sins? And Allah will say to each and every one of us, my servant, had I not already forgiven you, you wouldn't be here. Making us happy once again. You see, this is the extent of mercy when we say that Allah is Ar-Rahman. It's not containable, that information inside this little thing in your skull. You can't grasp it. That Allah gave you so much mercy in every day in your life. And all He is asking for you to do with your life is to do your best to be grateful to Him for it. To do your best to worship Him. And knowing that you're going to make mistakes, knowing you're going to screw up, knowing you're going to sin, when you do so, turn back to him and repent. The Prophet والسلام, said that there are two angels that go with every human being. One on the right and one on the left. One writes the good deeds, one writes the bad deeds. When you do a good deed, the angel who writes that writes it right away. When you do a bad deed, the angel who writes is told to withhold. Look at this. He's told to withhold. For a period, some say six hours and a period of time, quarter of a day, he's told to wait to write. Why? Why is he, why is he waiting? Allah is telling the angel, wait and see if my slave comes back to me. And if he comes back to me before you write it, don't write it. Don't even write it. It never happened. And you're telling me that you can't make it to Jannah? You're telling me that your life is too bad and you've done too much wrong and, and, and too much has happened between you and Allah for you to be a good Muslim anymore? Who are you fooling? You're not fooling anyone. You're definitely not even fooling yourself because you know better. You know better. And think about all of the problems that we have between each other. Think about the families that are broken up over arguments. Think about brothers and sisters who haven't talked to each other in years over incidences. Think about that for a moment. But yet we want Allah to let everything we've done go, but you can't let it go. You can't let it go. If you want to be forgiven, you need to learn to forgive. If you want to be shown mercy, the Prophet ﷺ said those who do not show mercy will not be shown mercy. So if you want to learn mercy, you want to have mercy in the world, show it yourself. Show it yourself. And as I finish, I'm going to give you a beautiful gift tonight. Yeah, I'm the guest. But I like to bring gifts. 
for all of you who are Muslim in the room and for our guest, I just want you to think about something for a moment. What was the first thing that Allah created? Close, close. Al Qalam, the pen. The first thing that Allah ever created was the pen. And He commanded that pen, Uktu, write. The pen wanted to know what to write. Allah said, write everything. Everything that will ever happen until the end of time. And that book is with Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said during his Isa wal Miraj that that pen has been lifted from the paper and the ink is dry. The Qadr of Allah has been set. For those of you that are, in, that are Muslim in the room tonight, how many of you were born and raised a Muslim? Raise your hand. Born and raised, always knew about Islam. MashaAllah, hands down. How many people in this room came to Islam later on in life through learning about the religion? Regardless of how you came, I want you to think about something. And when I realized this, people ask me, how do I keep going and doing what I do? You know, it's, it's tough. I have, I have a wife, I have children, I have businesses. I, I'm traveling on the road all of the time. There's a lot of headache involved in that, especially flying while Muslim these days. How do you keep going? I remind myself of this. No matter what I think I did to come to Islam, no matter what you think your forefathers may have done to bring you into a Muslim family, before anything existed, Allah commanded that pen to write your name. And then next to your name, Allah commanded it to write Muslim. What did you do for that? What had you done to be worthy of that? What? What had you done? Nothing. But Allah still said to that pen, write this person's name, and next to that person's name, write Muslim. Allah told that pen, write my name. And then in 1998, when, in, in, when his life, when you find December of 1998, write Guide to Islam. That's why I do this. I, I cannot repay. There's no, there's, no, there's no quantity of lives that I could be given to repay. So I do what I can with what I have right now. That's, that's all I can do. Hoping, hoping beyond hope, that when I stand in front of my Lord on the Day of Judgment, I will be able to say, my Lord, did I do enough for you to forgive me for what I didn't do? Did I do enough? That's, that's all the Muslim hopes for. That is the purpose of life in Islam. That we were created because the Creator willed us to exist. He created us with the intent to worship Him, fully well knowing that we're going to mess it up giving us the solution, the guidebook called the religion of Islam, the module by with which to be forgiving, which is repentance. And then we live our lives trying to do the best we can. And on the day of judgment, hoping beyond all hope that we've done enough to enter into the eternal gardens of bliss forever so that we can gaze upon the face of Allah. That's why we're here. That's why we do it. I hope that um, what I have said has been of some benefit. Know that if it is a bit of benefit, then all praise for that belongs to Allah alone. There's a reason the Quran starts with Alhamdulillah. Praise belongs to Allah, not to human beings. You can thank me, I'm grateful for it, but I'm more thankful to you. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever is not thankful to people, he's not thankful to his Lord. So I'm thankful to you for even being here. But if I have made mistakes, which is surely going to happen, then I ask you to forgive me for it and correct me where you see me make mistakes and go wrong because even Abu Bakr said the best companion is the one who corrects you. The best companion is the one who guides you when you've done wrong, not someone who praises you when he knows you're not doing the right thing. And lastly, before you leave, or before we start taking some questions and answers, we have a few moments before Salatul um, Asha. When you came in today, when you came in today, you saw a little table with DVDs. I'm going to explain what these DVDs are for. I've been making these DVDs for about seven years now because I kept trying to get people involved in da'wah and the excuses I kept getting was I don't have time, um, I don't have enough knowledge, which is not an excuse because da'wah is a command, which if you come on Saturday to the da'wah workshop at the Grand Mosque, you'll find out. It's not, a, it's not an option. And, uh, and something that is a command, you're also commanded to know how to do so ignorance is not an option and time is not an option either. But people had excuses. So I wanted to facilitate a way to get rid of their excuse. So I created these DVDs to give to non-Muslims, but then also to make available to Muslims to get them and copy them 
because you might not have time or knowledge, but you surely have enough time to put a DVD in someone else's hand. You cannot give me the excuse that you don't even have enough time to take a simple DVD, put it in someone's hand, say, here's something about Islam. The guy leaves his email contact on the end of it. If you have any questions, get in touch with him. This is what I do all day long, to the best of my ability. I have 140,000 unread emails, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. But I get back to the important ones quickly. And that project has been successful. For seven years now, people ask me, how many shahadas have you had? I didn't ever know I was supposed to count. I, I didn't never know that. So I never started counting from the beginning. But I do know these DVDs work or I would have stopped a long time ago. I would have stopped doing it. I would have found something else to do. Many people have taken shahada from these DVDs with me personally and have told me they've taken shahada after getting this DVD. They've contacted me. So I keep doing them. I give away 20 to 40,000 of these every single year myself. I, I give them away personally through direct mailing in the States and I send them to Dawah organizations that are poor. Which I don't... There might be some Dawah organizations here that, that don't have a lot, but I'm talking about poor Dawah places like in, in Sri Lanka, like in Ghana, in places like that where they don't have two sticks to rub together. You know, I try to send them to them to help them in their Dawah efforts to fulfill their obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the way I'm able to give away 20 to 40,000 of these every year is because they cost $5 a piece for me to make. You can, you can do that math really quickly and know that it's quite a lot of money. Um, and I put quite a bit of my business into it. The way I'm able to make that happen is I ask anywhere I go, I take some of these DVDs and I ask Muslims to purchase them from me. Because when you purchase one from me, I give you no copyrights. There are no copyrights on it. I don't know how you can copyright da'wah or knowledge at all. But you can copy it, and I want you to copy it. The goal is for you to copy it, because then I don't have to copy so many. And if you distribute them throughout Kuwait, it'll be a very beautiful thing. But also, when you buy one, I'm able to make at least two to three. One that goes back on the table so that that replicates itself, self-producing. And then one to two more that go out in the name of da'wah on your behalf. I get the reward, you share in the exact same reward with me. I'm greedy for good deeds, but I will share them if I'm not losing in the transaction. No problem with that. If I'm not losing in the transaction, hey, more the merrier. You can join in. E meaning every one of these that I give out and send out, you will share in the reward with it. So the only thing I ask for you, and I think there are about 10 or 11 different titles. Eight of them are for non-Muslims, but I want you to watch it. You cannot give a DVD to someone if you haven't seen it and you don't even know what's in it. So watch it before you copy it. Three are just for Muslims, especially the youth, about the strangers, about weakness of Iman. Um, and um, there's another one I can't remember off the top of my head. No, I said the strangers, weakness of Iman. There's another one just for Muslims. Um, but please come and get them. We sell them for $15 in the States, which was like 46 two Kuwaiti dinars, so I just rounded up to five, which I think is not exuberant for a DVD of this quality here in Kuwait. So please come and support this project. Right now I am currently about to send out 10,000 of them, 10,000 of them. And when I make 10,000 in bulk every quarter, they only cost me $1 per DVD to make when I do this 10,000 push. And right now we are trying to reach that goal. So if you purchase these DVDs and help me do that, if you want to give a little bit more to help that project complete itself really quickly, then you can do so, but please at least five dinar. If you don't have it and you're, you know you can't afford it, just come to me and I'll give you one because that's not the point. The point is to get them out there. And for our guests, please come and see me as you're leaving. I actually have a gift for you. Some of these are, are for you personally. Um, I thank you guys very much for your time. Please get some of these DVDs. If you have a personal question for me, I'll be at the table. Do we have time for, for formal Q&A? Do you guys want to stay for formal Q&A? Aisha is about to arrive upon us. Okay, really quick. Are we going to do Q&A? Do you guys want to do Q&A? Yes. If so, I'll stay another five, ten minutes. And then we can go and pray Isha, inshallah. Okay, real quick announcement. But one question, uh, one request. Unless you want to leave right now, please don't leave during the Q&A because it becomes very hard for me to pay attention to what's being said and becomes very troubling to those who are questioning and getting the response. So if you want to go now, you can go now. But if not, please, we're only going to take a few questions, just a few, five, ten minutes. I don't think the earth is going to crack apart and suck you all in in that time. Um, and then we will go, inshallah. <laughs> questions, yes, sister. Uh, what is that khair? I mean, I mean, all of us. Um, I'm from Sheikh Adlai's community. Columbia, South Carolina, yes. So I'm, I'm somewhat from the same community. Okay. He's one of my teachers. And I basically, I just want to ask, can I put this on my YouTube? Absolutely, yes. You can distribute this, but uh, please just keep it as is. Yes. Yeah, don't edit the content. Don't. 
I've had people put Star Wars music behind me talking and <laughs> don't make me track you down. <laughs> yes, you can, you can copyright the content. Not copyrighted, you can distribute it. Any other questions? Yes, sister. Uh, what, uh, you mentioned that uh, why uh, uh, there is the difference between the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad and the way it is ordered now with the Quran is So why was it? The question was, why is the Qur'an was revealed in a certain manner, but then compiled in a different manner? The true intent reason, we, we won't know specifically why exactly every verse is where it is. But the reason the Qur'an was revealed in the way it was revealed, because it was revealed for time and necessity and place. It was revealed as needed. Like if you see the earlier revelations, they were for the people in the Meccan period. It did not have any rules and regulations. It was all just about Akhirah. It was all just about Jannah. It was all about the, the affairs of attaching people's heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then with the Meccan, uh, the Medinan verses came more the stories of the prophets to connect with the, the, the Jewish community there at the time and to uh, give support to the Muslims and the rules and regulations. It's, there's a wisdom behind the reason it was compiled and there are some uh, books written about its compilation and how it was compiled and things of that nature, but the exact reason, Wallahu alam. Okay, does, it, does this make the difference the way we uh, try to uh, practice Islam other than the way we practice? No, there's no difference between the way they practice and the way we practice. The difference with some of the early Muslims is they were able to do things like not pray all at five times a day and they drink and things of that nature, but that was for them. Everything is complete now. Everything is complete now. We follow it to the best of our abilities in its totality. Its totality. But let me give you a really quick snippet. Do not think. Rome wasn't built in a day, they say, right? Don't think someone's going to come out of Jahiliyyah into Islam and be a good Muslim tomorrow. Never try to put that upon someone interested in Islam. That they want to become a Muslim and the first thing you do is you hit them with the rule book. You cannot do this. No, you cannot do that. You cannot do this. You cannot do it. Hold on a second. Hey, who told you you could do that? Someone I've even heard out of my own two ears. Can I become a Muslim? I cannot give up drinking yet. Can I become a Muslim? No. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I felt like hitting him. If it was halal. Are you serious? Yes, become a Muslim. Yes, but can, you eat, can you become a Muslim and still eat your ham sandwich? Yes, it's not permissible, but it doesn't mean you can't still do it. You do not keep someone from Islam. Because obedience to Allah comes with Iman. Iman, you do it willingly. You do it willingly. If you put a gun to someone's head and said, stop drinking, it's not going to do them any benefit. It will stop them from drinking, but they're not going to get any reward for it. Put a gun to my head and tell me to go pray right now. Am I rewarded for that salah? No. I'm doing it because you might kill me. Understand that. Muslims take time. Just the same way like Islam took 23 years to come to its completion, some Muslims may take years to really come fully onto understanding what is right and what is wrong. Be patient with new Muslims. Please be patient. First thing we do is we break out the stick. Second, they enter into Islam. Any other questions? Brothers? Yes. Brother? Uh, for people who, are, who believe in the creation, but are born into different religions other than Islam, for example, Christianity, uh, Judaism, different religions, they, they're born into their faith, they die into their faith. Would they have a chance to enter into Islam? The question was about people who were born and raised as Christian or a Jew or whatever have you. Will they ever have a chance at paradise? There is different levels and different opinions on this matter. For people who never heard about Islam, people who are known as Ahlul Fatarat, they will be judged on the Day of Judgment. They will be given choices on the Day of Judgment and that will define their hereafter. But the Prophet ﷺ, so those people who might not have heard about Islam, that's very hard to say in today's age that there would be people who haven't heard about Islam. But if there are, then Allah will deal with them justly on the day when they meet Him. But the Prophet ﷺ said, There is no person who hears about me, whether be he a Jew or a Christian, and does not believe in me, but he will end up in the fire. So if you've heard about Islam, and it's, and it's not upon the fact that you've heard everything that needs to be known about Islam. No. It is up to the human being to seek out the truth. That is, that is part of the human experience, is to look for that which is true. We do that with everything else in our lives. We won't buy a car without knowing it's right. Correct? Would you buy a car from some guy you did not know without ever seeing it, and he tells you it's the best? You know, here in the Middle East, everything's the best. Yeah, I need it's the best. 
I lived in Egypt for almost two years. Everything was the best. They'll say your car with no engine is the best. No, you would go and check it and verify it. So if you would do that with such something so minuscule as a car, why not about your purpose of your own existence? No, we have an obligation to seek that out. But for people who never ever heard about Islam, they will be dealt with on the Day of Judgment justly. Allah will deal with them justly, inshaAllah. He does not punish anyone unjustly at, at all. Yes, sister. I saw a sister had her hand. Yes. ideas about you. They, they see you as a sister in hijab, oh you're a submissive woman who's ignorant, you know, and they, it's so hard sometimes to just break through that pre-assumption that they've made of you. How is the best way to do that with people who have preconceived notions of what a Muslim is? Well, people who have preconceived notions that are incorrect, yeah. you got to be specific because they ha could have correct preconceived notions. Um, people who have incorrect preconceived notions about Islam are compoundly ignorant. They, they, they not only don't know about Islam, they think they know about Islam. Um, you need to be able to break it down to them very quickly and very clearly that what you know is incorrect. The way I like to do it is just tell them what you know is wrong. Flat out, because people don't like to be told that. They want to challenge that. What are you talking about? Let me tell you, give me five minutes and I'll explain to you why you're dead wrong. And then I try to take them to the essence of Tawheed. This is what that was about. That was about Tawheed. Tawheed Awlan, that's it first. Um, but we need to break through that preconceived notion. I don't mind telling them straight up, you're wrong. You know, uh, you might not like to hear this, but you're wrong. And then try to explain to them very quickly and succinctly why they're wrong. These are some of the things that we're going to go over on Saturday, inshallah. So please come to the workshop on Saturday. It's going to be, uh, I think, like four hours long, inshallah. We're going to discuss all of these things. But trust me, sometimes that shock value needs to be put there. Now look, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're dead wrong. Um, one last question. Yes, one last. Oh, you sure? Because I, I will be here. I'm going to stay for a few moments to help get rid of these DVDs. Please help me take these DVDs from dragging them around all of, uh, of Kuwait City, please, inshallah. Uh, so I'll be around for a few minutes if you want to come ask me a question at the table. Yes. Sure. So that's the question. Sometimes when you go ask why is this happening, they would say, don't question why. It's, sometimes you just can't question. It's just the way it is. So do you really believe that that's the answer? Or is there a reason that's yet to be known, but we don't know it? There, you see, when it comes to the question was about... Um, you know, there are some th many things in Islam that are clear with evidence, logical, speaks to the logic. And then there are some things that you just can't really define a reason for. Or you can't explain. Um, therefore, and you're just told that's just the way it is. So is that the right answer? Or is there some deeper meaning behind it? You see, Allah also revealed some of this wisdom in the story of Musa and Khidr. Because while Musa was with Khidr, Khidr was doing things that Musa thought was nonsense. He's wrecking these people's boat. He's killing this boy, you know, and he's building a wall for these horrible people, which all at the moment in time seem to be nonsense, illogical. There's no reason behind this. And then later on, Khidr explained to him that he was saving these people's vessel. He was preventing this child from growing up and being uh, misguided and, and being a fitna towards his parents. And if a child dies, he's going to Jannah anyway. And this orphan had kept his treasure under this wall, which he did not want the people to find. So sometimes the wisdom of a matter is not fully understood and may never be fully understood until the next life. You see, a lot of people disbelieve in religion, and I'm gonna finish with this, because they say the world is unjust. The world is unjust. That's for people who have a very finite definition of life. That, that life is from birth to death. That's it. If that's your concept of life, you're right. The world is an unjust place. There's a rooftop, go save yourself from it. You know what I mean? This is reality. There's, not, there's nothing for you here anymore. If you're not rich and wealthy and have power and the elite and part of the 1% that own 99% of the world, you're done. But for those of us who believe in the next life, which is the eternal life, the life to come, 
we believe that this world is completely just, completely just. Because a person who was a tyrant, who seemed to have gotten away with a life of ignominy and tyranny and, and bloodshed and murder, people think he got away with it. No, he didn't get away with it. He actually is worse off than had he been punished here in this life. Because he will have to deal with the next life, which is a punishment you can't endure. This is why as a Muslim, we had rather, if the hardships that come on us, we should be thankful for them sometimes because they are a relief of sin. They're a relief of sin. I would rather deal with it here than there. So the world is just. It is, but the human mind is very limited. You understand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, knowledge of the human being, you've been given very, very little knowledge. So we might not see it at that moment. When you can't explain a matter, then we are succumb to the, that's the way it is because it's in the wisdom of Allah. Allah is wise. He's just. There's a reason for it. I maybe can't understand it, but that's what it means to be Muslim, to submit. I submit to the will of Allah and whatever it is. Maybe I don't understand it now. Maybe 10 years from now I'll understand it. Maybe never to the day of judgment will I understand this matter. But I know that's the way it's supposed to be because Allah controls the affairs of all things. Therefore, we leave it at that. Because you can't explain everything. Even if I ask you, why does a Muslim pray five times a day? Not seven or three or six. Yeah, we don't know. There's a wisdom behind it. We just don't know what it is. So there's some things that are like that. Thank you very much for your time. Again, I'll be here. Please get some DVDs for me before you leave. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.